how things get lost, changed, missed, mislaid, or moved on in family life. Why is my shaving brush under the sofa? I think I know how the poltergeist myth began. You know, objects being mysteriously moved around the house. I met Miranda, who's just learnt to toddle, on the landing, carrying her father's shaving brush and two pairs of her brother's underpants, heading for who knows where. Of course, on the way she'll lose interest in them and her grip on them, and they will fall haphazardly far from their proper place. This, for a small child, is the joy of being upright. It's not the mobility. She's faster on all fours. It's the matter of having your hands free to transport things. Later, husband Simon will quizzically ask me, why is my shaving brush under the sofa? And Ben won't be able to find any clean underpants. Other people are mystified by this phenomenon, like the bachelor friend who paid a visit to our loo. From downstairs we heard his sharp cry of dismay. Innocently he lifted the lid and then stopped midstream as he looked down and beheld a flotilla of plastic ducks bobbing about. Such occurrences no longer amaze me, but they used to once. I remember when Ben was little, he was, like so many other kids, endlessly intrigued by the washing machine. And one day he was pointing and squealing with more than customary delight. Swirling round among the pastel-coloured baby grows and patterned cot sheets were these small, solid, brownish, dark brown lumps. I thought, well, never mind what I thought. When I stopped the machine mid-cycle, I discovered... Thankfully, that Benedict had just popped two pounds of new potatoes in for a quick spin and rinse before I loaded it with his baby clothes. Talking of underpants, I have to confess that they present a daily dilemma to me. How can a bright, dexterous five-year-old, who can easily turn 150-odd shaped bits of cardboard into a jigsaw scene of postman Pat Menza puncture, or transform a box of multicoloured Lego into a helicopter, or dive down into a packet of Frosties and instantly find the free gift. How can such a boy be totally incapable of putting two legs into a pair of pants? You would not believe how many incorrect permutations there are to putting on a pair of knickers. There are three orifices, four if you count the fly, two directions, back and front, two surfaces, inside and outside, and only one right one in each case. Most mornings I can be heard wailing. Why fronts, Benedict? Why fronts? They call them why fronts because the why goes round the front. Nothing seems to give him any sense of pride or achievement in dressing himself. And I've given up. I can see myself in years to come, creeping into court when he's a high court judge, to whisper, the dangly curls go over the ears, Ben Milud. Miranda, on the other hand, will all but give you instructions for dressing her. Released for once from her brother's hand-me-down dungarees, she was wearing an immaculate smocked frock for going to her first party. It was a joint birthday party for all the other one-year-olds in the National Childbirth Trust Mothers Group to which I belong. And I was just about to add some sturdy striped socks when she pointed to a pair of rather mimsy lace tights from a bundle of cast-offs. The final effect? Miss Pears eat your heart out. Well, Miss Pears can wait until Miranda has grown the centre top front teeth to match the outer pair, the absence of which even I have to admit makes her look like a dolly-sized Dracula. The party was splendid. One minute, a turmoil of toddlers, with Mark and Candida wanting the same drum, and Miranda unable to beat the drum, beating up a gentle boy called Dan, and George and Kit making a break for it through the back door, and then Fiona approaching from behind and winning the drum herself. The next minute, sudden peace. Seven wide-eyed one-year-olds round the party table, silenced by a cold sausage in each hand and spellbound by a single shared candle shining down from the realest rabbit cake you ever saw. 
I shall reveal my method for getting jelly out of smocking later, when I find one. A whole year has gone by, and for Ben, that means a new teacher. No more Mrs Morgan. I thought he'd be heartbroken. Not this fickle lad. Miss Wilson is younger than you, Mummy, and she never has a loud voice, and she's got yellow hair. No contest. Ms. Wilson, I concede. For me, a greater change. My friend Sally, who has lived round the corner since our first children were born, is moving to the country. She has minded my children with as great love and greater efficiency than I could while I worked. My children's affection for her and her daughters is total. Saying goodbye to Katie and Louisa, who have so generously shared their toys and their home and their mum, will be like saying goodbye to my own. Still, I expect Sal has packed my spare front door key, which she holds for when I lock myself out. And she won't be surprised when I turn up in Sussex to borrow it back. It's that damn poltergeist again. Picking up things you need and love and putting them down somewhere else. Or perhaps it's just that magpie Miranda. Where are those keys? Where were they the last time? Under the phone books? In Simon's Wellingtons? Who knows?